Welcome back. We've got a great chapter in store for us today. So yesterday, Job was talking and he was addressing the wicked and tyrants. And that is where he picks up right now. Okay, here we go. Verse one. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place where they refine gold. Iron is taken from the dust and copper is smelted from rock. Man puts an end to darkness and to the farthest limit, he searches out the rock in gloom and deep shadow. He sinks a shaft far from habitation, forgotten by the foot. They hang and swing to and fro far from men. The earth from it comes food and underneath it, it is turned up as fire. Its rocks are the source of sapphires and its dust contains gold. All right, so this is just pointing out that men search for metals underground, digging in the darkness and dangling from ropes to look for treasures. And I'm gonna leave it at that for right now. The path no bird of prey knows, nor has the falcon's eye caught sight of it. So birds with keen sight and stealthy animals cannot see or walk on the underground treasure troves. Man hammers at rocks, digs tunnels, and even finds where rivers begin. And as a result, he is able to bring underground things to light. All right, verse 8. The proud beasts have not trodden it, nor has the fierce lion passed over it. He puts his hand on the flint. He overturns the mountains at the base. He hews out channels through the rocks, and his eye sees anything precious. He dams up the streams from flowing. And what is hidden, he brings out to the light. But where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? So all this mining talk was to point out that men can find streams and minerals, but not God's wisdom apart from God. Verse 13, man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. So now Job's going to elaborate on verse 12, talking about wisdom. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it is not with me. Pure gold cannot be given in exchange for it, nor can silver be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold or glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for articles of fine gold. Coral and crystal are not to be mentioned, and the acquisition of wisdom is above that of pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from, and where is the place of understanding? Thus it is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the sky. Abaddon, uh, again a synonym for Sheol, and death say, with our ears we have heard a report of it. God understands its way, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. Huge statement there. Job and his friends have probed God's wisdom back and forth this entire time and basically have arrived nowhere near the truth. Finally, Job made the point clearly that the divine wisdom necessary to explain his suffering was inaccessible to man. Only God knew all about it because he knows everything. True wisdom belongs to the one who is the almighty creator. One can only know it if he declares it to him. Verse 25. When he imparted weight to the wind and meted out the waters by measure, when he set a limit for the rain and a course for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and also searched it out. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. All right, so as we've gone through this book, one of the reoccurring themes that we've seen through Job's speech is a believer's struggle with sin. I believe that his faith was genuine, um, but like the rest of us, he still wrestled with sins like complaining, putting the blame for his struggles on God, and doubts about his future. I'm sure that we all experience moments of lack of self-control from frustration and anger, harsh speech, failure to go to God when we should, bitterness, or making choices that we later regret. This is why I want each of us to listen to the sermon by Pastor John MacArthur that I mentioned yesterday called The Believer and Indwelling Sin, which is available both on Google and YouTube. I went over part one uh, last night and today while I was driving, 
and it is so well done and helpful. I really just encourage us all to listen to it. He pointed out another passage of scripture that I forgot about, and I want to read. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So the key is to walk by the Spirit, which would involve doing exactly what we've been doing, going through the Word daily, praying, and encouraging one another. This is how we grow and allow God to have victory in our lives. I guarantee that if we each look back on our lives this year, we can see the success. How many times we've made the correct choices, have displayed obedience, and by studying God's Word, have taken actions that we otherwise would not have. It is there, but so is the struggle. Pastor MacArthur mentioned in part one the key difference between surviving sin and reigning sin. Before being born again and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, sin reigns over a person's life in every fabric of their being, their choices and decisions, actions, speech, everything. But the moment a person recognizes their condition before God, believes in what Jesus did on the cross on behalf of their own sin, and places their faith in him, which leads them to repent, there is no doubt that change takes place. Yet, sin still survives and remains with the person because our current minds and bodies are not fit for heaven yet. The only analogy I could think of to try to help understand this a little easier is a lantern in a cave, which fits perfectly with our chapter today. A cave alone is dark, has stalactites, which are the rock icicle looking things that hang, bugs, bats, cold, wind, water erosion, all, all the above there. But deep inside it, there's no light. Then you bring in a lantern. That lantern now lives inside the cave and will make an impact illuminating it. And by appearance is now an entirely different looking cave. But it doesn't do away with the fact that it's inside a cold, stinky cave where things around it could dim its light over time. It requires someone to check the batteries, wipe off the dust from the wind and the dirt, and fix the cracks made on it from the stalactites. <laughs> and that's the Spirit of God actively working in us through prayer, Bible study, and the body of believers. The more it's maintained, the brighter it will shine, and the more effective it will be. Yet the light will not be entirely pure in its fullest and brightest capacity until removed from the cave placed into a new lantern made only for heaven, and its light source then generated solely by God in heaven without the need of a battery or any maintenance. And again, the power of it will be sustained by God himself with no threats or harm trying to restrain, damage, or dim it. It will just shine purely for eternity, never having a single defect ever again, and all the credit will go to Jesus. The battery reference there would be like a man's physical heart and his fleshly body. The light source, of course, is the same and pure, but will be the most bright once it gets into its own environment. That's my point. All right, let's go ahead and pray it out, and we'll go forth with our day. Lord, we're very grateful for what you're teaching us and how you're shaping and growing us. Um, what a great topic of discussion with my brothers and sisters here, and I really appreciate it. And... Um, Thank you, God, for their patience with me and and just helping us all to learn and, and grow with you. Um, Lord, we ask that uh, what we're learning today um, stays with us and keeps the doubts and fears and worries away, knowing that, you know, even, even though you're living with us, we still wrestle. We still struggle with things that we're not proud of. Um, we pray and ask that your illumination within us and your uh, that you would increase the capacity with you within us to the its fullest that we would um not heed and give in to sin as much as humanly physically possible um but heed to you and just to get the most out of this life as we possibly can with your guidance and we ask this of you we need this of you 
and we want to be effective instruments for you. Uh, that is our heart's desire. Um, but to do so, yes, we, we need to eliminate the obstacle of sin, and only you can do that. So uh, we pray that um, you would daily guide us in this area, help us uh, deliver us from temptation and evils, and um, help us to make the right choices with whatever comes at us uh, to make you proud and to represent you. And we lift these things up in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. Really enjoy this. And thank you for your time. God bless you and take care.